Welcome everyone tonight. I'm glad you guys could all be here and excited to see everyone's faces as they continue to pop up. And so um, we are excited for this week for, um, I got it, I let them in. Um, the first DNA gatherings to start um, happening this week, or maybe they already have happened, but we're excited to kind of get that kicked off and to start um, diving further into relationships with one another and also starting to build that bridge to starting to be together in person as your um, DNA group is comfortable with that. So that's exciting. Um, and then uh, just a quick announcement, couple quick announcements, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the kids' um, discipleship this week last week we talked about kind of covid and meeting in person and this week we're going to jump a little bit more into the kids plan for the upcoming weeks and so but before that the two main announcements are and um, the first one is next week um on the kids call it still will be from 4 30 to 5 but it's going to look a little different we are going to have um we're going to do the first part together like we normally do. And um, then during the lesson time, instead of a video, we're going to do elementary in one group and they're going to talk about Cain and Abel. And um, since that is not the most uh, preschool friendly story, um, we'll have a second breakout room for preschoolers. So if you have a mix of ages in your family, you may want to be set up on two different devices. So that way, after we do like the intro and the kids get a chance to talk and interact a little bit and we do the birthday blessing and that kind of thing, we'll split into the two different groups. And so just um, want to give you guys a heads up on that, but also like if you jump on at 430, there'll be a little leeway time to grab a second um, computer or phone or whatever if you forgot. So, and then the other thing is on Sunday, February 7th, it is Super Bowl. So while we will still do the kids call at the normal time, we won't have the 8 p.m. call, but instead we're gonna email out a liturgy and teaching for you and your household to do um, at, your, at your own leisure that weekend. So um, I think that is all for announcements. Tatum's anything else? Okay, great. Um, and then I'm gonna talk just a little bit little bit of a deeper dive into the kids discipleship for the next coming weeks and so um the first thing is just we're going to continue the rhythm of the weekly video calls for them for fourth from 4 30 to 5 and um there was a sign up that went out for the lessons and so i think it's already all completely full for the next couple months which is just awesome and i'm super excited about the way that the families are diving into this and just getting to know um families personalities and their kids um through that way of um engagement um and then um we will continue to be sending out the separate mon uh, Monday emails. And on that, I just wanna explain a little bit more of the things that are involved in that. So um, within the weekly emails, there's more information about the lesson and how to kind of um, expand that within your family. And there's some stuff that talks about um, the truth and the lesson through both the story of God and either the Jesus storybook Bible or the tiny truth. So you can kind of hit on the different age limit or age brackets that you have in your household. And that will allow that story to kind of run throughout your week instead of just be a little snippet of your Sunday afternoon. And so there's different questions and ways to engage in discussion with your kids through that. Um, the other um, thing that we've started sending out and um, your kids should have gotten, I think, three of the little peg dolls in the care packages or care bags was for Bible play. Bethany Fort has put together some great resources on just um, allowing kids to then play the story out, which is a great way for them just to continue to know and grow in that truth. And so um, there'll be more stuff that comes out each week with that for the next, at least for the next few weeks. Um, so that your family can just grow an understanding of how that would look. Um, and then uh, 
Other thing that we have mentioned briefly in the emails, but I wanted to explain further was um, all these kids, it's so wonderful to listen to the call and to hear all the different creative ways that they are made and their interests and all that kind of um, the way that the Lord has wired these kiddos. And so you know it's kind of tricky right now with being um, all separated. And so we wanted to provide an opportunity for kids to be able to engage with one another, even though they can't be together. So if your kiddo loves to write poems or scripts or color or paint or whatever, um, and you would like to do that, have them do something with that, um, with something that has involved this past week's lesson, if you just want to send either a video or a um, a picture of that, an email to Ben, he will include that in the next week's email. So that way kids can start seeing um, some artwork or some songs or some ideas from their friends, even though they aren't able to be together to do it. Um, and so we just thought that was a, a great way for kids to continue to grow in the truth, to express themselves, and then also to grow in their relationship with one another, since this time is a little bit tricky. Um, and then the uh, bags also included little cards of both um, scripture on one side and hymns on the other. And so we're just going to take a few verses every month and a hem every month and continue to dive deeper on that one verse or that one hem to really get it um, so that it's kind of buried within your kiddos hearts. Um, and then the last thing is we are starting to, um, gather people for both the st strategy side of the kids teams, which would be more of like the vision and where we're headed as well as just more of the implementation side of, um, the kids teams, which would be more teaching and leading. And if you did not sign up for either of those on that Google form, when you, the Google DNA form of like areas that you'd be interested in serving in, but you are interested in serving in those, just let me or Ben know. And that way we can be in contact with you because we are starting to kind of continue to take those next steps and create plans for what the coming months will look like for kids discipleship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other, does anyone have any questions about any of this? Okay. Well, if something pops into your mind later, feel free to text or email me and yeah, we can go from there. I'm going to take the next few moments and spend some time in prayer. Um, we're going to um, listen to a psalm and then use that as a catalyst for our prayers. You know, we, we talked before about how the Psalms are just a great way um, for us to um, not go wild with our emotions, but take our wild emotions to God. And um, we see that in the Psalm. So, um, so what we're going to do today is um, we're going to be a people who pray through and pray for the cultural moments that we're in. Um, we just, um, you know, had a inauguration with new leadership. We are still, um, you know, in in the trenches with COVID. Um, we're the light is shining brightly right now on our need for racial reconciliation and repentance from white supremacy. There's so much um, that we, as the people of God, um, get to pray for and pray pray over um, while remembering ultimately who our King is and who we serve and why we. Um, why these things matter, why it matters that we bring these things to God. Um, so we're going to spend some time um, praying through those things, however the Lord leads you to pray, um, especially after you listen to the song, what is prompted in your heart. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I want to give you a quick word. Um, I know that, um, you know, nobody likes like if, to pray on Zoom, like that's not our our preferred method of praying together on Zoom. Um, so here's my quick thing for you guys to remember. Um, if you feel awkward praying, you only feel awkward to yourself. It is not awkward to anybody else, okay? It is awkward to you 
and a blessing to everybody else. And I mean that sincerely. So um, I want to encourage you guys to, I know this is not the ideal way of doing things, but this is how we're doing things right now. So we're persevering through, um, and um, but that doesn't mean that we can't fully enjoy um, coming together as the people of God to pray. So um, the awkwardness is only within your own soul. <laughs> It is not felt by anybody else. So um, Allison's going to read for us the psalm. We're going to read Psalm 2. She's going to read it for us. And then I will open us up in prayer. Um, for those of you who the mute button is a major hurdle, you can go ahead and unmute yourself right now. Um, so, um, so that we can just take this time and just pray for our culture, our community, our nation, our world, whatever comes to mind, whatever has been heavy on your heart this week. So, um, Allison, will you read Psalm 2 for us? Yeah, Psalm 2. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter and you will shatter them like pottery. So now kings, be wise, receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the sun or he will be angry and you will perish in your rebellion for his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in him are happy. Um, for everyone, if you're still in Psalms, you can turn over to Romans chapter 14. Um, and as you turn to Romans 14, I'm going to ask you a question that I do not want you to answer out loud, um, unless you want to share it with the person sitting next to you and them alone, if you are sitting next to someone. But the question is this, when's the last time you found yourself judging someone? When's the last time you judged someone? Um, and as a follow-up, is it closer to a number of minutes or, than it is a number of days? Um, I'll share a story that does not make me look fantastic um, of one time among others that I judged someone this week. I was driving in my neighborhood and at a parking lot, uh, in a parking lot, I saw this uh, gentleman riding around on a scooter. Um, he's 40, 35, couldn't, couldn't have been younger than 35. It wasn't a skateboard, wasn't a Segway. Like it was just a, like a, a, a child's scooter, but, but made for an adult. Um, and I found myself judging that gentleman. Um, so again, if you like to scoot, again, I'm telling this in a way that does not make me look uh, fantastic. So if, if scooting is your thing, then, then good for you. But, but I found myself in that moment just, just judging him. Um, I'm, I'm generally anti-scooter in the first place. We've only had two broken bones among the Conley kids, and they've both been on Razor scooters. Um, but my judgment went just, it went beyond that. Um, it was this grown man in a parking lot riding a scooter and I just had all sorts of thoughts come to mind. Like is middle of the week, doesn't this guy have a job? Uh, a guy at this age, uh, really a scooter, like all sorts of these things. And I, and I found myself sadly, like becoming worked up about this. Um, and God had me at a stop sign and the person in front of me wasn't going. And so all, all God had me do was stare at this guy. And I found myself just judging him as other cars went and I was not able to leave the situation. Um, but the more I watched, um, I think God left me there for a reason while the person in front of me was God's instrument by checking their texts rather than going at the stop sign. But, but the more I watched, the more I realized this, this guy was just so happy. Um, like he didn't have a care in the world at that moment. And he was enjoying a couple hours in an otherwise really like, I mean, you were outside this week. It was a crappy weather week. And, and this guy was enjoying perhaps maybe the only nice day outside. And what's more as I realized as I watched him being happy and carefree, like he, he cared 0% what I was thinking at that moment. Um, here I was fuming and making assumptions of this guy and judging him. And it was not impacting his day at all, not even the least. And, and the only impact of my judgment was on me and my attitude and my heart and my soul. Uh, and I share that um, because I think that we all do things like that. Um, 
don't we judge people or things for for equally dumb reasons as that? Um, nobody's actually nodding right now, so maybe it's just me. Um, but but, <laughs> but here we here we walk into this week. Okay, thank you for the affirm, affirming thumbs up there. Um, we all judge people for really dumb things. Um, this week, as Jess mentioned, is the first time that Salt and Light's missional DNA groups will ever meet. Um, and if you haven't looked through kind of the, the foundation's workbook yet, what you'll see is that rather than jumping right in and saying, all right, let's just start discipling each other, or even, even, even before we start with what is the gospel, we wanted to start our DNA groups uh, by, discussing, by discussing assumptions. Um, Because everyone is coming into this DNA relationship with different past experiences. Everyone's coming in with different emotions, different perspectives and points of view. And if DNAs are really the heart of our church family, and and if it's through DNAs that we're going to pursue true discipleship, then we have to learn not to avoid our assumptions, but rather to bring them into the open and, and talk through our differences through the lens of Jesus and his gospel. Um, And so tonight, I'm not going to talk specifically about assumptions, but I want to bring out some things from Romans chapters 14 and 15. Um, And what we're going to see is this, is that uh, it is, it is hard to find unity in diversity. Um, And yet, God is glorified when his people pursue unity in diversity. And finally, we'll see from last few verses that Jesus is the only right source of that unity in diversity. Um, so I hope you came in reading Romans 14 this week um, and the first few verses of chapter 15. It's one of my favorite passages. It's a hard passage. It's a tricky passage, but it matters for us as, uh, in general, and then especially as we start DNAs this week. Um, for context, Romans 14 is toward the end of Paul's longest letter. Um, is a letter that he wrote to the church uh, at, at the center of the Roman Empire. Um, Rome at the time, at least in the Western world, was the height of worldly power. Uh, the emperor of Rome was, was literally revered and worshipped as a god. And the Christian church in Rome uh, was made up of small house churches um, that met in different neighborhoods, different barrios, um, different, different households across um, the city. Um, and so in some ways, they look a little bit like your DNA as well. Um, and like every first century church, the church at Rome was also a mix of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And that's important because that's the starting point for a lot of what Paul writes in these verses. Um, N.T. Wright, who's a a retired British Anglican priest, um, uh, said that it was likely, he's a historian, he says it was likely that instead of coming together in Christian unity, the Jewish and Gentile house churches in Rome instead continued to meet separately. And they would worship in their distinct ways. So you would have this household worshiping through these convictions and this household teaching other convictions and this other household. And and this this is the church as it existed in Rome. There were one church and yet they were operating very separately from each other and and not even finding unity in some of their beliefs. Uh, And man, when I read that, I was like, that that sounds so much like Christianity today. Um, Not the magazine. It sounds like today's version of Christianity in the Western world. It sounds like... The, the divided church, even though we're called to be united across our city. Um, adding to that and, and summarizing the last chapters of, of the Book of Romans, uh, there's an American <laughs> seminary professor uh, that said it kind of tongue in cheek. He said, after 11 chapters of dense and glorious theology, Paul's longest exhortation in Romans is this. Ready for it? Have people over to eat and don't argue about secondary things. After, after 11 chapters of glorious and dense theology, Paul comes to this, have people over and don't argue about secondary things. Um, and he goes on to say it is so simple and so profound. Um, so that's the context. That's kind of what brings us into Romans 14. Before we dive into a few verses, um, I'd love to know what God uh, showed some of you as you read Romans 14 and 15 this week. Um, what sparked, what, what did he stir in you uh, in general, and then perhaps specifically about unity and diversity. So I'll echo the, uh, the, the, the guard against awkwardness earlier and say that anything you share is going to be a blessing for others. So feel free to unmute. Um, and especially if you read Romans 14 and 15 this week, what stood out to you again in general or regarding unity and diversity? Yeah. 
I think we could all keep keep going on on different ways that we struggle with different people in my mind. I'm like, oh, you know the guy now, Michelle. You know the guy that that I was uh, judging in your scooter club. So you can tell him I'm sorry. Um, but what I'd love to, to do is kind of just give us a little bit of a framework as we walk through this chapter and, and to make it tangible for us, if you would, um, ask God to bring to mind someone who is a believer, um, who claimed to follow Jesus, who you know you don't agree with on some things. Um, and then also would God bring to mind uh, someone who's not a believer? Um, and would you just keep those faces and those uh, names in mind to make this a little bit more tangible? The image that comes to mind as I read Romans 14 is the question of how open is our table? Um, that's, that's often the question, I think. How open is our table? So I've asked the Bifords if they would read the first few verses of Romans 14. So I'll uh, let you guys do that, please. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on him, uh, on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convicted, convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the, uh, for the Lord he does not eat and gives thanks to God. So um, I love how Paul opens this chapter, but, but I think we can miss the irony a little bit. Um, I think what Ben Fort said earlier is true of all of us. Uh, we always assume ourselves to be on the right side of any, of any divide, of any judgment. Um, but don't miss the subtle jab that Paul takes here. Um, he's addressing um, those who are not welcoming those who are weaker in the faith. Okay, that's who he's talking to. Um, so question, um, is judging people a mark of Christian maturity or immaturity? And if we were all unmuted or in the same room, we'd all say ju judgment is a mark of immaturity. And, and so don't miss this, Paul's writing to people who see themselves as being mature, and yet he's pointing out that they're judging people they consider immature. That's what he's saying, the folks who, are, who they consider are weak in the faith. They're judging them rather than welcoming. And so this is subtle, but, but who's Paul calling out in the first, you know, volley of this chapter? He, he's calling out the one who judges. He, he's saying this is the actual immature one in the scenario here. And then he gives these two examples. One person eats only vegetables, the other meat. Uh, the second example is more odd today, um, but one person values one day above others and the other person values all days alike. And then for the rest of the scene that kind of unfolds, we see that both of those are, are questions of conviction and are questions of really a, a faith practice. How are these people living out their, their discipleship? Um, the, the debate's not like, like we, we go to this place, like it's like a vegan versus carnivore diet or something like that. And it's, it's not that. Um, we go to like whether, whether worship is limited to Sunday or if it's every day that we get to worship. And it's not that, it's, it's way bigger than that. Um, on one hand, there were Jewish Christians in Rome um, staying separate from the Gentile Christians, but keeping the old covenant kosher laws uh, and keeping the Old Testament feast days as marks of faith as marks of holiness before God. And so these really go beyond practice and, and, it, and it becomes part of their identity, what they eat or don't eat, um, the days they come together to celebrate, it becomes part of their, their identity. Um, and they alienate newly converted, never Jewish Gentile Christians in the same city. And then on the other hand, um, sometimes uh, pagan priests would resell meat that were offered to foreign gods, a little side hustle, hustle, make a little money. Um, and so both Jewish and Gentile Christians, some would avoid purchasing meat at a market, um, especially a market that was near a pagan temple, in kind of the mindset of what if, what if there's a chance this meat was sacrificed to an idol? Whereas other, both Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome, 
would say, well, we can't know. We can't know if it was sacrificed or not. I didn't do it. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. My conscience is clean before God. And so they would go ahead and purchase the meat. And so I'd love to ask, like, who's right? Who's right in that? And if we were in the same room, even thinking back to something that happened a couple thousand years ago, we'd probably get into a debate over who's more right and who's more wrong, even amongst the folks on this call tonight. And this is why Paul's charge is so important for us. Um, he repeats two different themes over and over again in, in chapter 14. Uh, the first theme, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains judge the one who eats. Verse 3, down in verse 10, to one side, why do you pass judgment on your brother? To the other, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And he kind of drives this first point home that he repeats over and over again in verse 4. And Laura read this a little bit ago. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Essentially, you're not his master. You're not his authority, her authority. It's before his or her own master that he or she will stand or fall. That's the first thing he says over and over again is, who are you to judge? The second thing he says over and over again is that both sides of whatever divide are acceptable forms of worship to God. And I think this one might be harder for us to, to, to swallow. Both sides of many divides are acceptable forms of worship to God. Again, verse three, kind of looking at both sides of, of the divide as folks look at each other, Paul says, God has welcomed him. God has welcomed the other. Uh, verse seven, the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord because he gives thanks to God. The one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. And it kind of drives it home down in verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And, and that's just a few spot checks. Allison read of, uh, verse 19, verse 17 says the same thing. Um, all through the, the, the last half of the chapter, he just repeats the same thing over and over and over again. This is a big deal to Paul. I think it's a big deal to 21st century Christians in the US as well. Um, we know that this past year, has shined a light on the division that just runs rampant in the American church. Across our nation, churches have divided, groups within churches have divided, even families and friends have split over politics and race and a question of justice and a few inches of cloth that you either do or don't wear over your face. Like it's, it's sad how easy it is for us to, to divide. Um, but it's also indicative of something that runs deeper. This past year and, and every year, there are tons of subtle divisions similar to the kinds that Paul brings up in Romans 14. Um, Christians, for any number of reasons, see others as immature and wrong, and by default, we see ourselves as mature and right. Rather than welcoming each other, we quarrel over opinions or judge others for their opinions, or, or we downright dismiss them whether their opinions or we downright dismiss them as humans. And for all the talk of diversity that at least happens publicly among some Christians, for all the many conversations about wanting to be welcoming people and everybody to come to the table, in honesty, many followers of Jesus are unwilling to engage people who think or act or worship or vote or value or look or interpret any single thing or verse at all different than the way we interpret. I wanna say that again. I want you to, to again, think of the person that God brought to mind who disagrees with you and the person who God brought to mind who's not a believer. For all the talk of diversity among some Christians and the many conversations about welcoming all people to the table, in honesty, many of us are unwilling to engage people who think or act or worship or vote or value or look or interpret any single thing or verse at all different than the way we do. And, and, and I have to believe that all of us fit that category on some level. And if that's true, that's not an open table. Um, that, that's not a true picture of biblical unity. Um, it may look like unity if somebody came into our house or our gatherings one day or this kind of stuff, but, but we only get along with everyone in the room often because we've run off anyone who thinks or acts differently than we do. 
And, and, and I wonder if we've ever considered how hard unity for the church in the first century was. It was not comfortable. It was not easy. Um, the fact that Jesus breaks down every dividing wall of hostility, that's beautiful theology. It's, a, it's an amazing phrase. But through the New Testament, we see time and time again how hard it was for Jews and Gentile Christians to worship together how hard it was to, for, for, for male and female to value one another as equals. And can you imagine how difficult it would be for slave and free people to learn to honor one another if both became Christians and they're part of the same small church community? What, what would that dynamic be like? And those are just a few of the dividing walls that, that Paul references in places like Ephesians 2 and Galatians 3. And so it's reasons like this that we're discussing assumptions this week. Um, assumptions are, are they are our worldviews, they're our experiences, they are the, the beliefs that shape us without us even knowing it. Everyone has them, very few people like to discuss them, but without bringing them into the light, we can't celebrate each other's differences and we can't honor each other, or perhaps we can't even grow in Jesus in new ways because our worldview is not like somebody else's worldview. Um, we certainly can't find Christian unity if we're not willing to discuss the places that we're different. There's an author called Arthur Brooks, and he released a, a, a book late last year called Love Your Neighbor, mid last year. Um, and it was about politics and other divides. Um, Arthur Brooks claims to be a, a Roman Catholic follower of Jesus. Um, and his claim is that there are three impulses that we turn to when anyone disagrees with us. And the three impulses we turn to, tell me if this resonates with you, we either ignore the person, we insult the person, or I love this one, we destroy the person. Ignore, insult, or destroy. And throughout the book, um, Arthur Brooks builds a, a fourth option um, that's based on Jesus's command. It won't surprise you given the title of his book. He asks, what if we actually loved our neighbors? What if we showed them human respect? What if we, we treated them as a human, even if they're not treating us as a human. And it doesn't sound that shocking, but man, it's so hard. And so I want us to, to just pause for just a moment. I'm gonna give us just a, just a moment to be silent um, and just ask us to pray, what, what is an area that you disagree with a fo another follower of Jesus? And rather than ignoring them, insulting them, or destroying them, what, what would it actually look like to see your difference as an area of discipleship and to love and honor and at least humanize that person rather than ignore, insult, or destroy them? Um, what would it actually look like to pursue a step of biblical unity in each other's differences? I'm going to give us 60 seconds to think on that for a moment. I'm not going to ask anyone to unmute and share what came to mind, um, but I do want to encourage us not to leave it here um, on a late Sunday night phone call, uh, Zoom call, um, but to ask if God would have us do something with that. Um, as I was thinking this week um, about some of the divides that we're facing right now and what it would look like to pursue unity, two specific questions came to mind. Um, I just want to ask these as, as examples of other divides. Um, for those of you who are elated that Joe Biden is now president, could you accept someone who joined the protest on January 6th at the Capitol? Peaceful protest, not the illegal one. That's a whole different category. But could you accept someone who joined the peaceful protest as a brother or sister in Christ? And on the other hand, if you strongly support a closed border, what would it look like for you to invite an immigrant to your table and see them as an equal through the blood of Jesus. And those two questions are not just easy, low-hanging fruit that I just wanted to poke at. And it's not just because they're current events. I, I think that is the kind of tension that was happening between Jew and Gentile divided Christians in the first century. It went to that place of emotion, if not even further than, than something that sparked in a couple of you when I mentioned that. Um, the no, I couldn't, there's no way, how could they ran rampant in first century Rome? 
Um, but it's in that kind of deep difference that Paul charges Christians to humility, to an open table, to talking, to becoming one, and to loving one another in Christ. Um, now, I said a few weeks ago that it is right to respect authority and, and in, uh, until that authority opposes God. Um, and for all the talk of non-judgment in Romans 14 and 15, we have to balance that. This is the tension that, that Marvin brought up a little bit ago. We have to balance the, that with the multiple one another commands that we see in the New Testament. Exhort one another, which means push someone toward something better, toward truth. Correct one another. Rebuke one another. Um, what do we do with those verses that are written by the same biblical author who wrote Romans 14 and 15? And to help us with this, um, I want to share a, a, my screen here and, and show us that the Bible shows three different kinds of division, three different kinds of differences. Um, and the Bible also th shows three different types of responses to those. So some of you have seen this before, others it's new. Um, but people commonly divide over these three kind of levels, if you will. Uh, we divide over areas of preference or values. We divide over areas of wisdom and conviction, and we divide over areas of sin and right or wrong theology. Um, and, and to make that a little bit more tangible, uh, preference and values, that's, that's just an opinion. I do this, you do that. Uh, this is in some, in some ways, there's nuance to all this, but in general, uh, public school, private school, homeschool. Um, this is the some diet and exercise. This is the, the worship style. This is the clothes someone wears. It's a hobby someone has. It's the guy on his scooter. Um, I do this, you do that. Um, that's one place that, that humans and Christians divide over. Wisdom and conviction gets a little bit deeper, a little bit stronger. This is often where our worldviews and passions show up. Um, our politics are, are, are areas of wisdom and conviction. Um, how we manage our household, some parenting things, some discipline things, some diet and exercise might go uh, beyond just preference and values into, into areas of wisdom and conviction. And then sin or, and right and wrong theology is, is, do you follow or oppose God and his commands? Um, are you misinformed about the truth and heart uh, behind God? Uh, the, the, true, the, excuse me, the truth and heart of God behind his commands. These are things like the Ten Commandments, like the several indications throughout the scriptures of what is sin and what's not. And so there's three different kind of types of division, three different levels of division, and, and the Bible gives us different ways to respond to each. Um, if it's a division over areas of preference or value, the Bible most often calls us to humbly defer to one another. In other words, it's not even worth engaging. Um, consider ourselves, consider others more highly than yourself, Paul says, among these same chapters. It's a picture of, of laying down your life and just valuing each other as humans and being okay with the differences. On the other end of the spectrum, if it's sin or bad theology, the Bible calls us to correct and rebuke that person, to call them back. Uh, this is church discipline, and the, and the goal of church discipline is not to just rail someone or to, to, to heap guilt or shame on them, but rather to, to regain a brother is how Jesus talks about it in Matthew 18. And so there's a correction there. There's a restoring that happens when someone is in sin. And then the middle category is harder. And perhaps it's the place where, where the most division lies. I don't know if it's the place where most differences lie, but, but it seems to be the place where a lot of divisions live. How's the Bible call us to respond to, diff to questions of, of wisdom and conviction? Most often it's not to berate someone on Facebook. Most often it's not to try to logicize through it and convince them that your way is better. The Bible more often calls us to pray for that person as if we trust that God might change their heart more than we do, um, to ask questions of that person rather, to tell them, rather than tell them all the reasons that they're wrong or right and then to model or show them a better way in hopes that, that by displaying the difference that Jesus makes in our life, they might be pricked by God to something different and better. And at the same time, are we open to different points of view? After all, God is the judge. He is the master that we will all give an account to. He will right every wrong, not just in other people, but also in us. 
And so it's a question of, are we looking to our Christian community as just going one way, we'll correct everybody else's wrong, or are we seeing it as a two-way street, accepting their truth? Perhaps we're the weak one in something, perhaps we're the one who misunderstands. Values, conviction, sin, three different types of division, three different types of responses, but the posture in all of them, and especially in the gray area between uh, the gray area of wisdom and conviction, our posture matters. Matthew 6 gets quoted all the time. You're not allowed to judge me. Don't judge your brother. You have a plank in your own eye. Don't judge your brother. Um, in Matthew 6, Jesus actually tells us it's okay to judge our brother but only after we've examined the plank in our own eye and removed it. Romans 14, instead of heaping condemnation on others, Paul charges us not to become a stumbling block to them. In other words, both, and other scriptures as well, both encourage us to look at our own life and our own belief first and perhaps discover that we're more wrong in some areas and we're, if I can use this term boldly, we're worse of a sinner than the people we're judging. In Romans 14, Paul calls us to look beyond what is right and what's not right. And in fact, he says that in love, ours is to lay down our rights. Look with me at, at Romans 14, verse 14. He tips his hand on what he thinks about the meet divide in this verse. He says, I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Think about that, nothing, no matter what you judge others for, no matter what you think they're wrong, and nothing is unclean in, it, in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking, what's it say? In love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. It draws us to this question that's really hard for, for us in our day to answer honestly. Is something better than being right in the kingdom of God? Is there something greater than winning in the kingdom of God? Loving people, sacrificing for them. Even if they don't deserve it, and even if they're wrong, Paul says, it doesn't matter. Love and sacrifice is, is frankly less about them and more an act of worship to God. After all, just a couple chapters prior to this, Paul tells us that we are living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, giving him our entire lives. We're more of a sacrifice than any meat offered to any idol. Here's the point in all of this, and then we'll close. Um, in Genesis 1, God created things differently. In fact, before Genesis 1, Maggie and I are doing a little catechism together. So we talked about the Trinity today. God is three in one. So even before God created anything, he existed in, in, in perfect unity, and yet each person in the Trinity plays a unique and distinct role. Then in Genesis 1, God created things differently. The kids' lessons have seen this for the last couple of weeks. Um, God's design was not uniformity, and that's important. His design was never that things lay aside their differences and become the same. Light is different than dark, and both are vital and needed for the rhythms of life and nature. Uh, similarly, it would be dangerous for land to try to become water. And yet God created them at the same time. You follow this image. Adam could not fully glorify God alone. He needed an equal and opposite to fulfill God's mission for him. And the point is this. God is, is more glorified as things that are different work together to fulfill God's purpose. And God is more glorified as, as we celebrate our differences and work together in unity. The church is stronger if we value all parts of the body, not just the parts you like the most. Life in discipleship, in community, life on mission is really better if the table truly is open to everyone and every conversation became a discipleship one rather than a, than a dividing one. 
And the reason I asked you to read the first few verses of Romans 15 is because it's here that Paul shows us that Jesus was the first to open God's table to anyone. Jesus did break every dividing wall and welcome Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free equally. And he did so not just when we had different preferences or convictions than he did. No, Jesus pursued us and invited us while we were broken and sinful and directly opposing him and running from him and rejecting him. Romans 15, 3 said that Jesus did not please himself. Again, just let that sink in. The king of the universe, the one who is always right, did not demand honor. He laid down his rights and was willing to be despised and rejected and insulted and mocked. He stayed silent, even in his sinlessness, even in the face of overt sin, because he trusted God as the full and final judge. He is the ultimate living sacrifice, and he showed us what the fullness of faith and power looks like. And then as a good king, he transferred his sinlessness and his righteousness to us. And he called us to unity in him. And we get to glorify God in and because of our differences. Finally, Jesus sent his spirit to enact that unity in us. Because we know this, we're powerless to conjure it up by ourselves. We're powerless to lay down our rights by ourselves. We're powerless to consider others more highly than ourselves. God alone will produce in us the very unity that he calls us to. So grab your bread and wine or bread-like and wine-like product because communion is a meal that God gave us in part to celebrate the unity we have in Christ. It's a, it's a common union meal, communion. Um, and so take the bread and as we break it, we realize and remember that it's by his broken body that Jesus, yes, unites us with God, but it's also by his broken body that he creates one body of many diverse parts throughout the earth and throughout history. We are one body, and we remember that as we share in the remembrance of his body. And then as we take the cup, we remember that Jesus' blood covers our sins. But in Acts 20, Luke writes that it's through the blood of Jesus that God created the church. And so we thank you, Jesus, for covering our sins and making us one in your blood. The last verses that you read, if you read this week, Romans 15, 5 through 7, are a prayer and a commission that embody our unity in Jesus. Um, it's only possible as the Spirit works in us and brings us into Christ's likeness. But, but I feel like it's just this perfect prayer as our first DNA groups meet for the first time this week. And so as our last act tonight, and I know we're right at 9.15, but as our last act, um, I want you to think of the people in your DNA group. Uh, if you're not in one, think of the people in your uh, close Christian community. And I want you to pray this over them and, and then consider this a charge to yourself and to your DNA group as we start this week. Um, DNA point people, this might be a, a good a good place to start uh, this week in the next few weeks, DNA meetings. I'll say it, you're muted, but repeat after me. And here's our prayer and our commission to one another. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the prayer and here's our mutual commission to one another. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God.